Um, I appreciate everyone coming together this morning. We've got uh, a lot in our plate. We have two important cybersecurity bills we're going to consider. In recent years, these hostile cyber adversaries, both foreign and domestic, have executed some of the most damaging hacks, cyber attacks, in our nation's history. Both the federal government and the private sector companies have been targeted and are increasingly being targeted. We held hearings on several of these incidents, as the members know. Um, we held hearings on some of the well-known ones, like solar winds and colonial pipeline attacks. Both of these incidents are stark reminders of the wide-ranging and real-world impacts of sophisticated cyber attacks. It affects our constituents directly. We need greater transparency into the frequency and effect of these attacks. That was one of the, uh, I think, consensus as we reached in talking to those who were attacked and talking to some of the federal agencies involved in this. The Cyber Incident Reporting Act will require critical infrastructure to report to CISA. That's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. We've tried to put CISA at the center of this. Um, one of my concerns has been the lack of accountability because there's so many federal entities involved. But we've got to be sure that CISA is getting these reports. There's also a uh, provision here that says that they are required to report within 72 hours when a breach occurs. We went back and forth on this and ended up with this uh, three-day limit, which you think is the right balance uh, to ensure that CISA continues to be a collaborative entity working with these businesses and giving businesses time uh, to make these reports in an appropriate way. There's also a notice of ransomware payments within 24 hours. This information will give CISA and its federal law enforcement partners greater insights into cyber attacks on critical infrastructure to better combat this threat. We also know that federal agencies have failed to make meaningful progress in implementation of their own strong cybersecurity practices as required by the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, FISMA. Two months ago in August, Chairman Peters and I released a report detailing the significant cybersecurity vulnerabilities of eight different key federal agencies, Homeland Security, State, Transportation, HUD, HHS, Ag, and Education, and Social Security. This report followed a 2019 report I issued with Senator Carper when I was chair of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations evaluating these same eight agencies. In this year's report, only one of those agencies had an effective cybersecurity program, DHS. Every other agency featured in the report failed to meet the basic standards. We also found the average grade across all government agencies was a C-. minus. The report identified several common agency vulnerabilities, including the failure to adequately protect personally identifiable information, maintain an accurate and up-to-date list of the agency's IT assets, install security patches in a timely fashion, and retire vulnerable legacy technology that's no longer secure. Securing fragmented federal networks against increasingly sophisticated attacks is critical, and yet it's not being done. In the seven years since FISMA was updated in 2014, federal agencies still have the same vulnerabilities year after year, putting America's data at risk. Today, we plan to take steps to remedy these systematic failures through the Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2021. It incorporates recommendations from these bipartisan reports we talked about. It also makes clear that CISO will play a leading role in helping secure federal networks by ensuring that federal agencies and federal contractors provide notice to CISA when they do suffer a cyber attack. Agencies will also have to provide notification to victims whose personal identifying information was compromised within 45 days. And also, we are updating the required notifications to Congress. In particular, this committee will get reports when an agency fails uh, to do its job and when it suffers a major cyber incident. And finally, while we plan to consider a bill today regarding inspectors general, I very much appreciate Senator Peters agreeing to my request to hold that bill over to the next business meeting so we have a chance to more fully vet it. Senators Johnson and Scott also sent a letter to that regard. I appreciate that letter. I just think this is such an important issue and typically has been very bipartisan. And we need to show the IGs that we do have uh, bipartisan support, that we, that we have their back. And so my hope is that we'll be able to have further discussions about the IG uh, legislation and, uh, and be able to mark that up uh, in the future. We're also considering three nominees for the D.C. Superior Court and one for the D.C. Court of Appeals today, as well as these three nominees that were talked about for the Merit Systems Protection Board. I want to speak briefly about the Merit Systems Protection Board, or MSPB. Many of us on this committee know the MSPB has been without a quorum since January of 2017. I think that's a problem. So we want to get these people in place. 
The current backlog of cases is over 3,400. Addressing the backlog is something that ought to be done. While we are voting on three nominees to MSPB today, I have strong concerns about one, Ms. Harris, who was nominated to be the chair of the board. I expressed those concerns during the hearing and my conversations with her. Members of this MSPB have to be steadfast in their impartiality. Now, I will read you what it says on their website about what MSPB's primary statutory function is. It's to protect federal merit systems against partisan, political, and other prohibited practices. Um, we've got to treat each federal employee that comes before the MSPB the same. And through her very partisan statements, Ms. Harris has generated doubt as to whether she can meet that standard. So I will not be able to support her nomination today. I do look forward to supporting both Raymond Limon and Tristan Levitt, who have both demonstrated a commitment to protect the federal merit systems. We also have four judicial nominees today. I plan to support the nominations of Ms. Putaguta, Ms. Lopez, and Mr. Staples to be associate judges for the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. I will not, however, be supporting Ms. Calderon's nomination to the D.C. Court of Appeals. I have concerns about her judicial philosophy, again, as we expressed in the hearing. The D.C. court system has an important role to play in addressing the district's most pressing issues, including the recent increase in violent crime, and I hope that each of our Superior Court nominees are prepared to take on this important role. With that, thank you, Chairman Peters. I look forward to a robust discussion today.